bless your heart. What do you think? Well, isn't it wonderful to see lives changed? Yes. Oh, hear this thing. What do you think? It could be that, what do you think? It'll work, won't it? it? If it gets real bad, we'll get another one somewhere. And, you know, just put this in a pawn shop or something. It'll, it'll be all right. <sighs> yeah. Did you know that before God created this whole world, he knew that you'd be sitting in that seat tonight? That's the absolute truth. That's what the Bible says. The Bible said all of our days were written in his book before we had lived a single one of them. Every one of them. Every day of our life is written in his book. The Bible said he did all this choosing before the world ever began. Isn't that amazing? There's a verse in the Bible. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor, and every Southern Baptist I know anything about can quote Ephesians 2, verse 8. It's a glorious verse. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But very few Southern Baptists I know of will quote Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10 says, For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we'd conduct ourselves in them. So I started studying that passage out of every translation I could find. One translation says this, You're the best God could do to display who he is. That's pretty amazing. You're the, one translation says, You're his stroke of genius. You're the best God could do to display his God deeds. See, a lot of times the devil will go, well, you're not, you're, you're not smart enough, you're not rich enough, you're not this enough. And see, it's, that's, that's all wrong. It's God that has qualified us and not we ourselves. That's what it says. Now, here's the thing that I really enjoy. You believe that? When did he choose us? In eternity's past. Here's what he told me. You ready? You'll like this one. He said he chose us in eternity's past to live in the present to forge the future. Chose us in eternity past to live in the present to forge the future. You believe that's true? It's absolutely true. None of us are here by accident. God is in control. You believe that? Aren't you glad God's not up there going, oh, never saw that coming. <laughs> He's not a God like that. He finished it before he ever started it. He's author and what? Finisher. Author and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, author and finisher. So I guess we better keep looking that away or the mic will just go, I'll show you. Oh, man. A lot of times these blow up. Thousands of these have blown up. Honest to God. I'll tell you, when, when the, they'll start the power surges, when it gets to doing like that, I can point at lights and they'll explode. So I was down in I was in down in Auckland, New Zealand, and we had 1,200 pastors in a in a sports arena there, and all of a sudden the mic started going whoa whoa, and I was preaching out of the Bible, Galatians, where it says that uh, behold I stand at the door and knock, and I was preaching about the knocking being signs and wonders to get our attention that God had something for us at the door. And so there's 12, 1,500 pastors there. And so all of a sudden, uh, I said, God, and I was preaching about the signs and wonders as being knocks. And so the mic started doing that. Wah, wah, wah. And so I said, well, most of the time when it does this, I can point at lights and they'll explode. So I pointed at a row of lights. Boom, the whole row of them exploded. So uh, that was pretty, pretty exciting. And then I stopped and started, I started prophesying. I said, I'll prophesy your headlines of your newspaper in the morning. Here's what I, I, I prophesied. Runaway girl returns home, prayers offered. Amen. You, the, the, that was on Wednesday. On Thursday night, following night, I get to the service again, open my briefcase, there's all the preachers, and I said, remember now, we're talking about signs and wonders being knocks. And I said, remember last night, I told you that I'd prophesied the headlines of the paper. I undone, undone the paper, held it up for him. It says, runaway girl returns home, prayers offered. I said to them, that was a knock. You believe that? And then, this is Thursday night. I'm, I'm talking about what happened uh, Wednesday night. I said, and you remember last night, I at the lights. So I pointed at a row, boom. And I, this is Thursday night. Boom. So I thought, wow, boom, boom. And every row of lights I'd point out started blowing out. Preachers are screaming. God said, if you don't stop, you're going to be in the dark. That's what he said. That's the absolute truth. 
So we flew out of Auckland, went down to another uh, uh, island there to do another pastoral conference. We're in a brand new sports arena. Brand new sports arena made out of stainless steel and glass and beautiful. So there I was teaching the people prepare to embrace the winds of change. So I got up and I said, well, tonight I'm going to start teaching on embracing the winds of change. When I said that, a wind started blowing outside, started blowing the trees over. A wind got inside of the building, started blowing the flags off the walls. People were screaming. I was excited myself. I thought, my God, this is going to be show and tell. You know, see, the early church had show and tell, didn't they? Mark 16, 20, God would send out, they'd, and then God would validate and vindicate what was being said with signs following. You believe that? He still does that. He really, really does. So here's, here's one of the things he told me to tell you tonight. He said, to tell you, don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your dream. Uh, it's Hebrews 10.35. Hebrews 10.35 says, Don't fling away your confidence, your dream, your assurance, because it has great recompense of reward. Yes. For ten, two decades, for 20 years, for 20 years the devil's been doing all that he can to get you to give up on your dream. Just give up on it. Well, it didn't happen. It's too late now. No, it's never too late. And all the promises... 34,000 promises in the Bible. 34,000. Isn't that, that's a lot. And the Bible says not one single promise of God will fall to the ground. Every one of them are yes, yes. Say it. Yes, yes. That's right. All of his promises are yes, yes. There's a verse that says he'll roar over his people with the word yes. So God wants to say yes to you. Do you believe that? Do you believe if your ways please him, everything you ask him, he'll say yes? When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll give him the desires of his heart. No good thing will the Lord withhold from him who walks upright. See, his answer to you about everything, if your heart pleases him, is yes. Yes. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. I'm glad God's not up there going, well, I don't, I don't know yet. See, but if our ways please him, he'll give us what we desire. And I'll tell you something else about that. When you really are in tune with God, you're not going to ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. I'll tell you what, when you feel with the things of God, you can begin to command God. Whoa, look out now. That's right. When your heart is full of the Word of God, here's what it says. 1 John 5, 14. 1 John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask Him anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. If we know that He hears us, we know we have the petitions we desire of Him. So I'm telling you, the Bible said, Concerning the works of my hands, God speaking, command ye thou me. What He's saying now, get so full of my word, so when you speak, you're speaking my will. You understand that? It'll turn prayer from a plea to a proclamation. From home you to God, you said. You believe God wants to answer your prayer? Oh, we're in a season of God answering prayer. We're in a season of an assured welcome. That's what it says in the Bible. It's in the Bible. This is a season of an assured welcome. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 said, It's a time that He'll hear you. It's a time He'll help you. It's a time of His favor. You believe that? Yes. Uh, okay, I'll just read it. Uh, oh, I leave, we leave early in the morning, don't we? Five, good Lord. Got to go, we're going over there to uh, Calgary. Going to have a conference there. That'll be fun. We'll have a good time. Don't go to church and don't have a good time. If you're going to church you don't have a good time, go to another one. Don't, don't stay there. The Bible says let the dead bear the dead. Come on, follow Jesus. Ain't no sense going to a dead church. You believe that? Ain't no sense in it. Well, you know, Granny went there and Papa. Well, they're dead. Get somewhere else. That's true. I went to, well, I shouldn't tell it, but I'll tell it. <clears throat> we go to, uh, we're in uh, Ireland. We're in a city in Ireland. And I've got a group of uh, several group, several pastors with me. And we go into a Methodist church there in Ireland. And I don't want to step on anybody's tradition or anything unless we need to. But anyway, we get in there and it's, it's a beautiful old building. 
very, very ornate, very, very beautiful, wonderful workmanship. But over here, I didn't like a section. I'd walk by the section, I'd feel something. You know what I mean? Yeah, it wasn't pretty, didn't feel good, something wasn't right about that. So I'd just kind of stay away from there. And one of my, guy, one of my guys was, was with us. He's a pastor from Atlanta. He got over there and he came back over there to me. He said, man, I don't like what's over there. I said, well, I'm not wild about it myself. And so the pastor of that church, I said to him, what's that section there in your church? And he goes, oh, well, we have a custom here. When anybody comes, we set their Bibles over there and we just reserve that for them. I said, I don't like that. I don't think God's wild about it either. You know, they ain't hanging around there. If they are, hey, they missed the boat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So my friend from Atlanta, he's, he's very explosive. You know what I mean? So he goes, what? And he jumps over there and runs, and he starts throwing those Bibles. Boom, boom. Oh, boy. But do you, you understand? We've got to have a living church. We're not some kind of mausoleum for the dead. Another time. Can I tell you another thing? My wife and I, I've always wanted to drive down through Mexico. Old Mexico. You know, I, I don't know why, but I've always, I didn't want to go to the, the scenic places. I wanted to get in the car and drive hundreds of miles down these little bumpy dirt roads, cactuses and burrows and burrows. So I got to do that. My goodness. We just drove and had a good time going down through there. It was the wildest thing you've ever seen. On the way down through there, I'm miles and miles and miles and miles in, in Mexico. And the Lord said, pull the car over. I said, why? He said, because you're told to. So I pulled the car over. I don't speak Spanish. God does, apparently. And so uh, I, sa I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go to that store and buy. They were baking bread, round loaves of bread. And said, buy every loaf of bread. So I go in there and we buy the whole back seat full of bread. Stacked and smelled good. Then he said, go. So me and my wife are driving through a desert. And so help me God, I looked up there and I thought, is that a deer in the road? Or what is that in the road? It was children. And they were trying to sell hoot owl, little desert owls and snakes on a stick and stuff like that. So this is true. So I stopped. And so there are these little, these little kids. They're very small, dwarfed looking kids, and I thought, well, I can't talk to them, you know, they're going, I ain't never going to go, I'm not going to go, I'm going to go, and then they saw the bread, and so the Lord said, give them a loaf of bread, so I reached back there, and I got a round loaf of bread, and I gave it to those kids, and they, all right, you know, all right, boom, and they ran back out in the desert, and then in a moment, here came the tribe, they lived in holes in the ground, listen to me, they would dig holes in the ground like an animal, and they lived in that desert in holes in the ground. Boy, we had us a time. Man, good Lord, giving out bread, talking about Jesus, you know. Isn't that wild? But that was fun. But anyway, on my Mexico trip, we keep driving and driving and driving, and we get to this place. It's, the atmosphere is so different. The humidity is so, um, so uh, different till bodies don't, they automatically mummify. And my God, they got a whole warehouse full of dead people. And you can just go in there and look, Guanajuato. I went in there at Guanajuato. Good Lord. Where? They're mummified. Now here's the thing that got me. When we came out of there, there was a vendor selling meat on a stick. Now, who in their right mind wants to eat something out in front of a warehouse full of dead people? Now, I said all that to say, don't go to a dead church. Listen, I mean, if there's different, but the dead people, that's where we were at. We ended up in Guanajuato. That's a long way down there, isn't it? Good Lord. Wonder what though? That was some that dead people. I don't know. You, you can see sometimes you can see the disease that killed them. Uh, yeah. 
You ought to preach in some of the churches I go to. Yes. I tell you what, you need to lighten up a bit. People, people think the prophetic ought to have long, bushy eyebrows and a big old crooked finger. I don't believe Jesus. If we prophesy, we just talk to people like the, just talk to them, see what'll happen. But anyway, we're, it's very, 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 very critical that the church realizes who they are and realize time. And it's time to get very. Yeah, I will change that because this is you know. That's aggravating. It's aggravating. Oh, it's so I, I forgot. I, uh, it's in this pocket. Uh, well, it's really probably probably a good mic. I may have mashed a button or something. What do you think? What do you see? You see anything? What do you think? Where do you want me to put it? I, red redneck lapel, man. Look there. We'll try to. If it cuts up again, we'll grab that one. What does this do? <laughs> We'll see how much faith you got. I know it. We'll see. My God, get, get him away from there. Save the kids. Get the, get the kids out. Sure. I'm faster than I look. That's right. That's right. That's true. Plus, I've been watching cage fighting. I can put a rear naked choke on you just like that. It's kind of like going to heaven, but you get to come back. You ever had one? You cut the blood off in this oxygen. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Everybody, it's going to be okay. I know this, you're going, he don't know what he's going to do. Listen, I'm like a mosquito at a nudist colony. There's plenty of stuff to do. You know what I mean? Don't think about that too long, you know. It's, yeah, he, he's going to <laughs> kind of wipe that thought out of his mind. Hey, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you a story about uh, a gal getting saved the other day. I'm all, every week I'm flying somewhere, and so I get to the airplane uh, counter just in time to hear the little lady go, Flight so and so has been um, delayed. Meow, meow, meow. And I thought, God, that was the only connection I had to make the meeting. Wah, wah, wah. And anyway, so I, I don't drink alcohol, but I, I love uh, sparkling water and lime. So I go over to a bar, and I'm still just mad as I can be because I missed the flight. Gonna miss the, it's going to mess up the whole conference I'm going to because I just had enough time to get there. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I've got me a, a sparkling water and lime, and I'm sitting on the stool, and I'm going, God! Why did you cause that wank, wank? And then all of a sudden, he basically said, you know, Bobby, it's not all about you. <laughs> then he said, look down there about six or seven rows on the bar stool. About six or seven rows down was this gal. She had a little spiked hair. And the thing that caught my attention was this. Well, a couple of things. Number one, she had a margarita big enough to drown the dog in. <laughs> I mean, listen, you could have washed a Volkswagen in that thing. She was lurched over it, and I thought, oh, man. But she had a little spiky hair, and she's, I guess, mid-20s, late-20s, something like that. But she had this grotesque-looking tattoo, much like Mike Tyson, swirled around her face, you know. And so, anyway, I'm looking at her, and she feels me looking at her, sees me looking at her, and she curls her lip very hostile, shoots your eyes over there, and uses a very, very bad word. What the? And use the, you know, what the are you looking at? I said, you. Yeah. yeah. I said, do you expect to do all this and me not look? And then it stunned me. I said out of my mouth, if you'll come sit right here, I'll tell you why you're hiding that mask. I'll tell you what, she came. She didn't get to come to get a prophetic word. She came to have a confrontation. You know what I mean? She plopped herself down there. And I looked at her and all of a sudden, I saw what had happened to her when she's a little girl. I saw an adult male hold her down and terribly, terribly uh, 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 violate her. 
And I, and I said to her, I'm so sorry. And I, I started repenting. And boy, it broke her heart. We lead her to Jesus Christ right there. Now I'm going to tell you what. Her tattoo didn't change, but her face did. I'm telling you. And then the Lord told me, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I'm more concerned about a wayward girl sitting in a bar than I am a whole civic center full of people that's already heard it all anyway. That's what he told me. That's what he said. So he'll inconvenience you to get his gospel to where he needs to put it. You believe that? Yes. Yes, sir. Reed, that's true. He'll do it. I love how he wants to get the gospel to the ends of the world. If he had his way, every human being on earth would get saved. Yeah. Right. It says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come repentance. That's what it says. It says God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. You say, okay, if God's a sovereign God, an all-powerful God, why don't he make everybody get saved? Because he wants volunteer lovers. He wants volunteer lovers. You believe that? And so I'm begging you to give your life a fresh and anew to the call of soul winning. I was off in a civic center in Houston, and I was preaching along there, and I saw a silver mantle, a silver sheet looking thing, come flying through the building just like that. I said, God, what is that? He said, oh, I'm releasing a spirit of evangelism. So I turned to Keith Miller sitting on the front row. It was his conference. I said, Keith, God said he's releasing a spirit of evangelism. Nine adults jump up, run forward, give the heart to Jesus. No invitation, no altar call. Just at the proclamation that God was releasing a spirit of evangelism, it stirred their heart. I'm telling you, this is the time for soul winning. You believe it? Don't say there's four months. Now's the time. Behold, lift up your eyes, look upon the fields. They're ready. The problem is the laborers. We've got to pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust forth labors into the harvest field. People, i tell you what, here's what he told me the other day, he, the Lord did. He said, seekers will be finders and finders will be sought. Seekers will be finders. That means if we're seeking God, we'll find him and then we'll have divine wisdom, we'll have understanding, we'll have enlightenment and then the world will begin to beat a path going, my God, how does this work? What's the answer? You, seekers will be finders. Finders will be sought. I said, give me an example in the Bible. 1 Kings 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. Remember Solomon? It says, the queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba made a journey to come to see Solomon. The Bible says she came to trick him, try him, test him with hard, arduous, difficult questions. And here's what it says in the Bible. The Spirit of God through Solomon, answered every one of her problems. Every one of them. And here's what it says in this Bible. She left breathless. She was so stunned. She left breathless. I believe that's going to happen again. I believe the gospel, uh, the, the Lord Jesus is going to come on the church with such an anointing, the glory will be upon the church, the wisdom of God will be upon the church, and I believe political leaders will beat a path going, how, how does this work? What, what's the wisdom God wants to give us? Here's something God will give everyone if you, if you want it. Isaiah 50 verse 4. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, I will give you the tongue of a taught one that you'll know how to reply to those that are asking you, how do we navigate these dark days? That's something. Isaiah 50 verse 4. I'll give you the tongue of a taught one. I want it, don't you? It says in James 1, 5, if any of us are deficient in wisdom, if we'll, give it, if we'll ask God, He'll give it to us. And it says He'll give it to us lavishly without chewing us out for asking. I want the wisdom of God, don't you? We need it. We desperately need it. I quoted the verse last night. I quoted Nehemiah 9.20. He gave His good spirit to instruct us. It's a sad thing, I think. One of the leading businesses in America right now is psychics. Horrible. You won't get enlightenment from a psychic. You'll get darkness and a demon. They don't know the way. I'll tell you the difference between a psychic and a prophet. A psychic tries to tell you what the future holds. A prophet tells you who holds the future. That's right, World of difference, you know what I mean? But here, here's the deal. Psychics can't tell you the future because they don't know it. I'm going to show you in the Bible who can tell you the future. You want to? Say please. Turn with me, if you will, to John's, the Gospel of John. John chapter 16, and I'll read verse 13. John 16, verse 13. 
Jesus is talking, talking about the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, the truth-giving Spirit comes, He will guide you into all the truth, the whole truth, the full truth. He will not speak His own message on His own authority, but He will tell you whatever He hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to Him and He will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. Is that what it says? There it is, just right right there in black and white. He'll tell you what's going to happen in the future. You don't need some kind of voodoo psychic. You need the Holy Ghost. He'll tell you what's going to happen in the future. That's what he says. you believe that? Now, a while ago I told you we're in a time of an accepted welcome from God. I want you to look in the same chapter, John 16, verse 24. It says, up until this point of time, you've not asked. Ask now, you'll get what you're asking so that your heart will be happy. Up until this... Well, I'll just read it. John 16, 24. Up to this time... You have not asked a single thing in my name as presenting all that I am, but now ask and keep on asking and you'll receive so that your joy, gladness and delight may be full and complete. Amen. You can get your prayers answered now according to this verse. Remember I told you it's a time of favor? Go with me now to 2 Corinthians. Did we look at that one? Well, we're going there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For, this is Paul writing, for he says, in the time of favor of an assured welcome, I have listened to you, I have heeded your call, and I have helped you on the day of deliverance, the day of salvation. Behold, now is truly the time for a gracious welcome and acceptance of you from God. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is a time of an assured welcome. Now, any time you find in the Bible where it says, for he says, Paul is quoting something here. I should say he's quoting someone. He's quoting Isaiah 49, verse 8. That's what it means. For he says, let's see if he quoted him right, okay? Isaiah, let's find it. It's in this Bible. It's in the old port. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 49, 8. Thus saith the Lord. I like that. Thus saith the Lord. In an acceptable and favorable time, I have heard you, I have answered you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, and I will preserve you and give you for a covenant to the people to raise up and establish the land from its present state of ruin and the appropriation and cause them to inherit the desolate moral waste of heathenism, their inheritance. This is a a good verse, isn't it? Say yes. Yes. Isaiah 49.8. Remember that now. Patty, ask him when to get on. Ask him, what verse was that Bobby talked about? Isaiah 49, 8. In an acceptable time. See, you can get your prayers answered now. You believe that? Yeah. This is the time to ask him. It's Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me. I'll answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things. Amen. And it says what you had no comprehension of. The Hebrew says things that you couldn't get any other way. Fenced in till you asked for them. You believe you have not because you? We got to start getting our hearts so hungry to see the kingdom of God. We'll ask Him for big things. Yeah. Don't lose your dream. For 10 years, the devil's been doing everything he can to get you just to give up. It didn't work. I tried it. But let me tell you something. The Lord told me, He said, This sound, Bobby, is almost muted on earth, but it's very amplified in heaven. I said, God, what sound is that? He said, it's the sound of the shattering of dreams and the breaking of hearts. See, the person sitting by you may not even know you have dreams and a shattered heart. But God does. He wants to help you through this. Do you believe that? He wants to get you back to the place of real confidence, knowing that God can do anything. I'll tell you what, the Lord told me, he said, I'm releasing that anointing that rested upon Caleb. Don't you like the name Caleb? It means a salty old dog. That's what Caleb means. So, well, it actually means a dog that can catch a camel. It means tenacity. It means not giving up. 
It means pursuing. I, I, I challenge you, don't give up on your dream. Amen. It's closer than you think. But Caleb, I love him. After 40 years of delay, none of it on his part. He was, wet, he was ready, wasn't he? 40 years of delay. 40 years. And he said, I'm still well able. And he was. And he got his mountain and one beside it. Where the giants were. You believe that? Were the giants there? See, 40 years prior to that time, they could have walked right up there and took their mountain. But they decided to put human intellect to work. They said, let's send some spies and see if God told us the truth. Remember, he said, go into the land. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's yours. So they chose them 12 spies, sent the spies in. Here's what they saw. They saw fruit so big, a stalk of grapes had to be put on a pole and two, two soldiers carry them off. Big harvest. Yeah. But it says, when they saw the inhabitants of the land, they were giants, and it says, when we compared them to ourselves, we looked like tiny grasshoppers. So they let what they saw keep them from believing what God said. Forty years. Isn't that, isn't that bad? But Caleb never lost his fire. He said, I'm still well able, and he was. So he took his mountain, the one beside it. I like that kind of tenacity, don't you? Amen. Boy, I'll never forget when I heard the first time I ever heard the word tenacity. Football coach said, well, one thing about Connor, he's got tenacity. I didn't know what I had. You know, I thought, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what it meant, but I thought it, something's failed me, you know. But it was a good thing, not a bad thing. Football, oh, man. I went back and played the old-timers football game. They televised it. It was horrible. They taught me into it. Now, that, that doesn't speak much for me, does it? They said, now, don't worry. It's going to be three-quarter speed. Only one in three-quarter speed was me. The rest of them studs was people got their legs broke, concussions. And yeah, old-timers football game, full pads. Boy, the first couple of plays, I felt good. After that, I couldn't even spit it. Just hang on my lip and I had to... Horrible. Good Lord. I tell you what, I was sore in places I didn't even know was still there. Good Lord. That's true. My wife said, see, I told you. Yeah. It was a fundraiser, right, for the doctors. That's about who, that's about who made the money there. Yep. Did I tell you about when I got my tongue cut off playing football? I told you all that, didn't I? Good God. Yes, it's true. I was playing, you know, I was playing football. The guy was running. I leaped just in time for his heel to catch my chin. Well, back then they didn't have all those mouth guards and chin straps like they've got now. The helmets were not leather. You know, I wasn't that far back. But anyway. <laughs> Whack! Just like that, my mouth filled up with, it felt like jello. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It cut my tongue in two. You could run your finger. So, I mean, blood just... <laughs> so they go, Gah! you know. You can't see it yourself. You're just looking at the coaches. So they said, we got to carry the doctor. So off to the doctor. I go, a doctor named Dr. Ron. I wish I had some of them Jaws movie. Dun, 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 you know. I mean, listen, Dr. Ron. You can kind of hear the sadistic in it, can't you? So I get there. This is the honest to God truth. And he says, well, good news, bad news. Good news is I can sew it up. Bad news, I can't deaden it. And then, yeah, yeah. I, that's do what you got to do. He jerks out a needle. Have you, you ever seen a needle they sew a tongue up with? It's crooked like that. So I, I, I lolled it out. It's awful. <laughs> out through the top. And then he tied a knot, and I go, hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. screaming like a baby. Hey, hey, hey. And he, he he sewed my whole tongue across there. Every time a, a loop and a knot. Hey, hey, hey. That's basically I'm going to knock you out if I ever get out of this chair. Hey, hey, hey. So he finished. This is all the truth. He finished sewing my tongue together. Then he said, just as I was leaving, he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, it's going to hurt worse when I take them out. So my tongue was swollen. I said something like that. 
question is. That means you ain't taking them out. I took them out myself. Honest to God. Self-medicated, you know. Just bit the ends of them off and pulled them out. Yeah, good Lord. My wife says, Bobby, you've got more to talk about than that. Well, it didn't happen to her. It happened to me. It's kind of... Well, it did. It just... But anyway, I want to tell you, God wants to do something good for you, something that will stimulate you and get you to the place where you said, God's not going to withhold any good thing from me. All of His promises are going to be yes. I can approach Him boldly. There's a verse in the Bible. If it wasn't in the Bible, I'd never believe it. It's Zechariah 3.7. It says, if you'll honor God, serve God, live for God, He will give you open access to His presence. Open access to his presence. So I thought to myself, that can't be right. So I looked at it in the Hebrew and everything else, and it means unfettered open access. Nothing blocking the way. You meet his requirements, you can come boldly into his throne. Come with full assurance. That's what it says. Well, you know, I don't think... Well, you, you can. Because Christ has made a new and a living way. When he died upon the cross, something happened. Some veil was torn. Remember that? See, what has separated us is not there any longer. We can come boldly to his throne and receive grace and mercy to help in the time of need. I suspect we're in the time of need right now, don't you? I suspect we're further away from the kingdom of God as far as the way things are going in the governments, the way things are going in economics, but God can turn it around just like that, can he? I get to go to these think tanks all over the world, you know, good gracious, political, economic, journalists, and all this kind of stuff. And most of them are not Christians, and they just talk about the world problems. So it finally got my time, and they said, I said to them, how many of you in this room agree that we're in the largest global storm we've ever been in? Every one of them. Every one of them, not a single one of them denied it. They said, yes, we're in the largest global storm we've ever been in, in every arena and aspect. We are, aren't we? So I said to them, as far as I can ascertain, we have one priority, finding out who started the storm. We're in a big global storm. Who started it? If the devil started it, you and I can rebuke him. However, should it be God? Should it be God, our only recourse is to appease Him. So I said, my answer to who started the storm, and I waited. I waited. It got so quiet in there, you could hear a rat run across cotton. That's quiet. <laughs> I know it. What you been doing? What happened to you? None of my business? I want to know. Just whisper. I won't tell anybody. I had a fight. Oh, no. Oh, you know, they saw, talk about, well, anyway. The only fight I liked was the one I won. You know, it says, fight the good fight of faith. I mean, the only one that's a good fight is the one you win. Is that true? Yeah. It's true. Listen, I never like to get the crud beat out of me. That's true. Hey, did you know there's a verse in the Bible that tells us who gets into fights a lot of times? Those that tarry long at the wine. It says those are the ones that have cuts and bruises without cause. That's what it says. That's what it says. Yeah, I've been right there, man. I got a hole in my head right there. A cop hit me in the head with a uh, stick. You can stick your finger in there if you want to. That's true. Yeah, I was all fighting on the street, having a gang war. Up the cop came. Isn't that crazy? He, you know, he said something like police do, and I said something like thugs do, and wham, hit me in the head. Knocked a hole in my head right there. He got in his car, drove off, left me on the cement. Honest God. But anyway, I left the hole, the hole still there to remind me they bear not the sword in vain. You know, they're not a terror to those that are obeying the law, just to those of us that are not. That's right. It's true, isn't it? Well, the plane's leaving pretty early. Isn't it? <laughs> One time I was catching a plane at 3 a.m. in the morning. My son that works for me said, Daddy, what idiot made you those tickets? I said, I did. <laughs> he said, I'm so sorry, but that's true. Can you? I didn't even know airplanes flew at 3 a.m. 
Boy, they would do out of Las Vegas, I'll guarantee you. Well, anyway. Airplanes, good Lord. Yeah, Buffalo early. I don't know what's wrong with they charging an arm and a leg nearly for flights. Isn't that something? It's crazy. I'm telling you, the I was going to have to go to London the other day, and so I just called the guy that works to travel for me, and I said, would you mind calling and see what a first-class ticket is from Tyler, Texas, to London? He said, are you sitting down? I said, well, it could be $15,000. I said, okay. Business class, $8,800. I said, coach. Yeah, $800 and something. dollars. That's crazy. Well, anyway, I think it is. I want that kind where you just think, boom, you're there. Amen. Said, the Spirit caught away Philip, and he was, didn't this see? If that happened to them, it ought to be happening to us. Isn't that something? That's right. <laughs> Used to, they treated you nice. Now it's kind of like a cattle prod. <laughs> Keep them doggies rolling. Yeah. Pretty bad, isn't it? But anyway, better than Paul had it. Take him, boy, it'd take him a whole long time to get back to North Carolina, wouldn't it, from here? Yeah, and we get, you know, we got to quit whining, hadn't we? We call it intercession. God called it whining. <laughs> whining, yeah, that's true. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit, and then I'm going to pray for you. Here's what the Lord told me. He said, go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do when you get there. I'll give the people an impartation out of Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. So because you've been in this room right here, you'll get this anointing, an impartation of Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Here's what that verse says. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting, never failing covenant, make you perfect. Give you everything you need to accomplish what you're called to do. Make you perfect. Give you everything you need to accomplish what you're called to do. I don't know about you, but I want that. So I looked up the word make you perfect. It's a word that means missing no component. Missing no component. Everything you need, you have. So I'm telling you, man, there's some things God promises us that's unbelievable. Here's one, Colossians 2, 9. It says the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ. Everything God is dwells in Jesus Christ. You go, I believe that, Bobby. Oh, it's Colossians 2.10. I want you to look at it. Colossians 2.9 says, It pleased the Father that the fullness of deity would dwell in Jesus Christ bodily. Verse 10 says, And you are complete in Christ. That means everything Christ is, is in you. Everything God is, is in Christ. Now everything Christ is, is in you. See, you start believing that, you're going to go, Wait a Wait a minute. See, the devil doesn't want you to know who you are. He wants you to think you're a worm, weak, worthless. But here's what God says you are, a king and a priest. Here's a a little insight of who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.20. How does that start? 2 Corinthians 5.20. It starts with a little three-letter word. I write N-O-W. Now, now. Now are we ambassadors for Christ. If that's what I am right now, I want to know a couple of things, don't you? Number one, what the heck is an ambassador? If that's what I am, a senior representative sent out with anointing. Sent out with authority. Wow, I like that so far, don't you? Right now in this present age, I'm a senior representative sent out with authority. Knock, knock. How much authority do I have? Answer, same amount as the one sent me. Matthew 28, 18, all power, all authority is given unto me. So, listen guys, there's power in you. I like that. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, it says, Now now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. According to the power that's at work in you. You believe you've got Holy Ghost power in you? It came in you when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. Now, He wants out of you. Holy Spirit's tired of being captive inside the 
lives of unbelieving believers. Yeah. 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 He wants free. He wants you to be able to do anything. Today, I, I watched an old video clip on YouTube of A.A. A. Allen. They brought in a guy dying with advanced stomach cancer. So frail, little arms, hadn't eaten in weeks. Here's what the doctors had told him. We can't help you. Go home and just starve to death. He couldn't eat. Anything he ate came right back up. Hadn't eaten in weeks. So they brought him to A.A. Allen. First thing A.A. Allen said, he said, before I start preaching, I want you to know I've already ordered this man's supper. He's going to be healed and eat in front of you all. You can pull it up on YouTube and watch it. Right there on, on, on television footage, you see this guy get healed. You see him eat right there on the camera. Drank a whole little quarter of a pint of milk. Ate part of a sandwich. Isn't that something? See, now, if that could happen back in the 40s and 50s, we ought to be way ahead of that now. The kingdom expands, not decreases. It's true. Ah, So you're going to Bible school? Isn't that cool? I tell you, that's wonderful. It's Mark chapter 5. Remember that? It was a, a crazy maniac. And the crazy maniac was naked. I call him the nude rude dude. He comes storming out of a great living graveyard. Came running to Jesus. And Jesus cast all the devils out of him. And he seated and clothed in his right mind. Then he said, Jesus, carry me to be with you. I want to go with you. And he said, no, go back to your friends. Show them and tell them how great things the Lord has done. And he went to a ten ten city region and proclaimed all that Jesus was. Isn't that something? So that's where you'll be. You'll just, it'll, the Word of God will come out of you. It'll come in you and then come out of you. Yeah, it's really true. Who I'm telling you. I'll tell you what the devil did. I used to drink shaving lotion, shoe polish, sniff glue, gasoline, break in the hospitals, get the drugs, throw them in sack, <laughs> shake them up and take a handful and sit there to see what happened. That was the devil attempting to race my mind. That's right. I'll tell you what God will give you if you want it. He'll give you a sound mind that can maintain and retain the facts of God. Yes. Yeah. Said God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So I looked up the word sound mind. It means a mind that can catalog and retain facts. I don't know where we get this idea. You get a certain age, you don't know if you're bingo or bowling. (laughs) Have to wear the pins and all that kind of stuff. Hey, did I tell you that? Well, anyway. One time I was going through a prayer line. I was ministering in a prayer line. And I could feel this woman about four or five people up in front of me and I could feel real apprehension real apprehension because now bless her heart now I can understand this her problem was she wanted the Holy Ghost but people were falling over crop 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 but she had bladder problems she's afraid if she fell over she'd you know embarrass herself you know bladder bladder control problem so I thought dear God and she was nervous about it didn't want to confront it so I thought Lord I want her to get the Holy Ghost but I don't want her to get embarrassed da 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 so I get in front of her and guess what I said I said honey you can depend on God hey hey see she was alright I was alright what down she went yeah you can depend, yeah. See, that's true. Good Lord. Yep. Depend on God. Uh, once I'm doing a meeting, and I said, I want any woman in here that has female problems to come stand forward. God's going to heal you. Boy, you could hear cheers and shuffling and people and so I, I, I was just had my eyes closed waiting on the Lord any woman in here with female trouble come down here God's going to heal you so I'm back behind a podium and I open my eyes a whole a whole string of them and I get right along there and here's this old gray haired guy he's standing in those line of women so I said to him I said sir do you have hearing problems? No. I said, didn't you hear the invitation? Yeah. I said, it was for female trouble. And then he said, old gray-haired guy, he 
He said, if anybody in here has got more female trouble than me, I'd like to see them. <laughs> see? Huh. I'll tell you. Sometimes you just have to go on down the line and go, God, he's here. You, you brought him in here, you know. It's true. Good Lord. Anyway. So here's what God wants to release for you. Hope. Assurance. Joy. And I'll tell you another thing. I have an anointing on me. I can break any kind of sleep disorder off of anybody. Any kind of sleep disorder. We've got stacks of testimonies where people, one man said, I hadn't slept for years without medication. And I'll tell you what, here it is, there's a verse in the Bible that says, He will lay his servants down and their sleep will be sweet. I used to think while you was awake you could fight, fight the demons off, but when you would sleep you just kind of open pray. And boy, that's not true at all. He said, I will send my angels and they'll encamp around about you. He'll watch over you in the night seasons. So I'm, in just a moment, I'm going to pray for anybody and everybody that's having any kind of sleep disorder. Now, I want you to know something. We give God perfect permission to interrupt our sleep. He can awaken us in the night seasons. He can trouble us upon our bed. Anything He wants to do, I'm for it. But I'm going to take a real stand now and bind off any kind of demonic activity that's been harassing you. You know what the devil will do? He'll keep you up, try to get you so tired, you make crazy decisions. He can do that. Yes. Our government studies about sleep deprivation. Deprivation, is that it? That's right. Easy for me to say, you know. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you can make some bad choices if you're deprived of your sleep and your rest. Yeah. So the devil knows that and he wants you to make some bad choices, but God wants to lay you down, your sleep be sweet. He wants you to be awakened and be refreshed, yeah. rejuvenated. You want that? Yeah. So if you want that prayer, if you'll stand up, I'll pray for you. Anybody suffering from any type of sleep disorder? That's good. I'll tell you what, number, one of the number one selling drugs right now is pharmaceuticals that deal with sleep and mood altering substance. Isn't that something? I'll tell you about anxiety. You cannot have to repent of it. That's in this book. You can't medicate it. You have to repent of it. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. In prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But anyway, I want to pray for those that are having sleep trouble. Lord Jesus, your word declares, you will lay us down, our sleep will be sweet. So right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority over any kind of sleep disorder, insomnia, anything, not terrors. We break their power in the name of Jesus. And I release over your saints, over your people, a wonderful, perfect night's sleep. Lord, where they sleep, their body rests, their spirit rests, their mind rests, and they wake rejuvenated, ready to face a bright new day. So I release this now in the name of Jesus. Say it, I receive it. I receive it. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. And you watch, it'll happen to you. It will happen to you. Don't have to have Lanesta or Ambien or anything else. You'll sleep like a baby. You believe that? Yes. It's really true. You go, well, it's got to be different. No, no. It's the God of peace that crushes Satan under your feet. Do you read that? Mark, what? Uh, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Shortly. Very good. All right. Looking at your shoes, I was. God's tying you on some new shoes. Running shoes. Spiritual running shoes. God's about to accelerate some things in your life. You go, oh, she's handling the spiritual end. No, listen. He's tying you on some spiritual running shoes. So you're going to have to run to keep up. I'm serious now. You, you don't own it? Yeah. But that's the way it's going to happen. It's going to intensify a hunger inside of you that's almost uh, inquenchable. And it's, it's really something to be good for you. You believe God will intensify a hunger? I'll tell you what, for the last 10 years, He's been fanning. He's been fanning the flame of discontentment so you won't settle for less than He wants to give you. Fanning the flame of discontentment so you won't settle. So that's your husband, big old tattooed looking fella. Yeah. God's active. You know that. He's active in a good, good way. That's a wonderful thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm just, this thing kind of fascinated me. I like anything that's holding something up. Did you read in the Bible about the pillars in the temple of God? Yeah, things that hold things up. Good. How old are you? Me? Yes. I'll be 32. 32. You don't look 32. I know, thank God. Thank God. Isn't that something? <laughs> See, you're about to enter priesthood years. 33 is the year of priesthood years. But I'll tell you what. Remember, uh, the, they were talking, of, Patty was talking about sowing seed and being a farmer. You've been faithful to sow seed for a, a long time. And that's really good. So God's been teaching you some things about that. I'll tell you what God can release. Witty inventions. Smart plans that work out. Smart plans that work out. Yep. Well. Who's this sitting here? Do you know? Tell me about him. Is he a sweet guy? How long have you been married? 46 years. 46 years. Oh, man. 48? See? One year less than me. My wife and I will be married 49 years in October. Good gracious. Yeah. Next year will be 50. Maybe she'll buy me a gun or something. <laughs> or maybe an airplane or something. Who knows? Well, God bless you. Yep. I, do, I used to pastor and I did a lot of marriage counseling. So I just cut through the whole thing. All you got to learn is I do and yes, dear. <laughs> You get that down, everything will work. I do, and yes, dear. But you have to make that yes, dear seem like it was her decision, you know. Yes, dear. You know? I mean, listen, you, uh, America, we got Dr. Phil. Y'all ever watch Dr. Phil? I mean, you miss that one. He can't even help you. It's true. What's your name? Lorraine. Lorraine, God bless you. Good. I tell you, all, you're going to get a verse straight from the Lord. You get John 15, 15. That verse says, I don't call you a servant anymore. I call you a friend. I'll tell you what, a friend, he gets to know the inside information from God. A friend. It was the friend that knew the timing of the wedding. The friend of the bridegroom, remember them? What do you do? I'm a school bus driver. A school bus driver. I did that once. That was something. Man. <laughs> no, no, I see him. Woo. Pretty rambunctious. Is this your phone? There's a phone. Okay, good. Just checking. <laughs> what do you do, this guy right here? Me? Yes. I'm going to oh, man. Welcome to the world. <laughs> See, we're transitioning, aren't we? I'll tell you what I asked the Lord. I said, what's all this sifting and shifting going on? He said, I'm trying to position people for a promotion. All the sifting and shifting is to get us to a place of promotion. That's true. You never did tell me, you never did tell me about this fight. Did you get everything settled? Or? No. Oh, no. No. I tell you, the best thing in the world is just forgive. Honest to God. Honest to God. There's a verse in the Bible, here's what it says. It says, if you've got an enemy, pray for him, and it'll be like heaping coals of fire upon his head. So after I got born again, I realized you couldn't settle it with knuckles and knives and sticks and guns. So I would go, I thought... God won't let me get him, so I'll pray and let God get him. And then, I really looked at that verse. It'll be like heaping coals of fire upon their head. It means they can't stay in that situation long. See, back then they didn't have big lighters and gopher matches. If you went after fire, you carried a crock pot, uh, an earthen vessel, and you picked up live coals. And in the Middle East, they carried them on their head. You think you can stand there all day and argue with a pot of hot coals on your head? No! So that's what happens. Pray for your enemies. It's like heaping coals of fire upon their head. They can't stay in that situation. So best thing to do is just go. It'll help you. That's true. It's getting really wild now. That's kind of disturbing, isn't it? I'm not, it doesn't, you know. Well, Maeve, Sister Maeve, done run off. Oh, she's got to go catch a plane. She told me she had to leave early. I, we better use that one, Henry. What do you think? 
Oh, no, no. Hey, I'll, I'll stand stiller. Stiller? That's not a word, is it? Just, just throw him in there. That's why I like George Bush when he's president. Remember him? I told y'all Indians are coming, didn't I? Yeah, let's try that one. Let me mash this button off. We're about to quit anyway. I've got to get up early. Yeah, I know. Everybody goes, why don't he straighten up? Why don't you settle down? Don't be so uptight. Chill out a bit. It'll be okay. Just go. <sighs> it's, it's going to be all right. One time the Lord said to me, you amuse me. That's what he said. That's true. That's what he said. What do you do? I work in the accounting department and uh, we help pastor in Buffalo. Oh, that's wonderful. I used to be a bookkeeper in a big company, believe it or not. That's when computers were about the half size of this tent, honest to God. They sent me out to study computers. They were big, massive computers. Now you got them in your pocket. That's what I did. I got an accountant job for NIPAC Industries, and I was 21st on the seniority list and wasn't even qualified to get the job. The Lord said to me, I'm going to give you that job. So I said to the 18 with, I said, God's going to give me that job. They laughed and hissed and they said, Ha! You're not getting that job. You're 21st down on the seniority list. Plus, you ain't got sense enough to do it. Guess what happened? They disqualified 21 people. They 20 people. When I got there, they said, Can you type? I said, Do I need to type? He said, yes, you need to type. I said, how much do I need to type? He said, 72 words a minute with three mistakes. Now, I took typing in school just to be at the girls. That's true. I'd put, you know, I'd put a finger sprang, sprang thing, and I'd say to the typing teacher, look, football injury. But anyway, guess what happened? I typed 72 words a minute with less than three mistakes. Got the job. Isn't that something? That's where I was at when I surrendered to preach. Running the company for that. Isn't that something? The Lord said, I, I, went, I got, got saved, got called to preach. Well, they, taught, they paid me to study the Bible. They said, as long as you do your job, uh, you can do anything you want to do. So I could do my job in no time. And they just paid me to study the Bible. Honest to God. And then, boy, the Lord said, I'm through. I want you to get out. So I went to the main guy, a guy named Charles High. So I went to Mr. High. He ran the whole company. I said, Mr. High, I've been saved, born again. I'm, uh, I'm giving you a three-week notice, and I'm quitting. I'm starting pastoring full-time. He said, Bobby, that's, that's, I'm glad that things have changed in your life. But listen, here's what he said. You've got a bright future with this company, and I beg you, don't quit. I said, no, three weeks, I'm gone. So I, after three weeks, I resigned took my leave. About four months later, I opened up the newspaper and it says, NIPAC Incorporated bankrupt. Bright, shining future. But see, God's still humming. You know what I mean? That's true. That's true. Yeah, NIPAC. I'm, you know, since Sister Maeve's gone. <laughs> he, said, he said, don't make me kick you in the shin, boy. It's all right. It'll be all right. If I tore it down, angels would hold it up. Do you believe that? Amen. Yeah. Do you believe we're in here by ourselves? Answer is no. Angels come with us. Sometimes they appear on the, on the platform with me. Sometimes they take pictures of them. Sometimes I start glowing and almost disappear right in front of the people. You can look at it on my web page. If you look at www.bobbyconnor and go to the... I got Facebook. Did I tell you all about that? <laughs> My grandson, the one that's 18, he said, you're not still emailing, are you? Just learned how and it's antiquated. You're not still emailing, are you? I go, yeah. Then you get around these kids, they go, you got Facebook, you got this, you got that. They go, do you tweet? I go, I'm out of. Hey, look out now. Yeah. There's a chance, you know. But anyway, I was off in Ogden, Utah the other day, preaching, my wife and I. 
And a lady named Cindy McGill was taking pictures. She takes a picture. So she takes another one right beside that one. And one of them I'm normal. Next one I'm glowing. You can see through me. It's on the web page. Crazy. Stirred up a bunch of stuff. Remember last night I told you about that woman that's coughed up uh, 64 g- gemstones from her mouth. Now I don't understand that. But if God wants to do it, I'm for it. Hark up a few. You know what I mean? If God delights in it, I'm tickled. I had a theologian one time raise his hand. Everywhere I'd go, people get gold teeth. I preached a funeral and people got gold teeth. People that didn't even want gold teeth would get them. One preacher and his elders came and he got a gold tooth right in the middle of the message. He came there to disprove it. Got him a tooth. Well, anyway, a theologian one time raised his hand. And here's what he said. Give me one good reason why... God would put gold teeth in someone's mouth. I said, oh, that's easy to aggravate somebody like you. And that's the absolute truth. He will offend our mind to show how callous our heart has become. See, if it tickles God, I'm for it. I, I don't care if it's feathers falling, gold dust falling, people spitting out gemstones. Listen, here's one. Y'all know Mahesh Shabda? Mahesh Shabda Ministries. I was at his church one time. And I, he was sitting on the platform. And I turned around to him and said, Mahesh, one day people will be on their hands and their knees here picking up diamonds. I turned back around like that. There was a guy on his hands and knees. He said, here's one. The one he picked up is $30,000. Mahesh Shabda's wife, Bonnie Shabda, said, here's one. She picked hers up, put it on her in her hand, then put it on her finger and was carrying it to the camera so the camera could zero in on it. And the camera begins to zero in. It goes and disappeared right in front of everybody. Isn't that something? Most time I talk about them, they'll fall. I was talking about diamonds once and I said, here's one. And I kicked it like that. And a woman screamed, it's mine. And it fell out of her ring. You could see the claws on her ring in the little post. But what's the chance of me finding it on a carpet and kicking it towards Here it is. Isn't that cool? See, God can do stuff. Listen, over in Coeur d'Alene, there, we've got a CD or DVD, whatever it is, on the book table somewhere. And me and Paul Keith and Bob Jones went to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And we started preaching a few days after we left. Gemstones started falling. 50 carat gemstones. One of my friends went there and a big one went wham, fell on the ground. He picked it up and had a ring made. It's the most beautiful ring. Uh, Jeff Jansen, I mean, 50 carat looks just like a ruby, big old. So they've had all kind of gemologists look at it, you know. And here's what they said. We can't identify it. They said it's too perfect cut to be done by human. Well, I don't understand that. Well, welcome. I don't either. But do you understand? I'm for it. I don't understand a lot of what God does. But I'll tell you what he did to help me along. He said, I have more power to direct you than the devil does to deceive you. God said, I have more power to direct you than the devil does to deceive you. See, that's how you'll start getting experiences with God. Instead of shutting yourself down, say, okay, God, do with me whatever you want to do. Say it like Samuel a long time ago. Remember, Eli gave Samuel some pretty good information. Next time you hear it, say, speak. Your servant's listening. No, well, Eli, it took him a while to get this thing in gear, but he finally did, didn't he? Realized it was God. Remember, Samuel hear a voice. He'd go, sir, go to bed, boy. Remember? Then finally realized, whoa, that's God. So he said, the next time you hear that voice, say, speak. Your servant's listening. Do you believe if you'll pursue The supernatural, you'll get a deeper encounter. Said Moses saw a bush burning and said, wow, I'm going to look at this and see. Then the Lord spoke. He said, John the Revelator heard a voice and turned to see the source. And we got the book of Revelation. Well, if we're satisfied just with church, we won't get nothing like that. You have to get hungry. How old are you? How old are you? 33. And my oldest son's 46, I think. My youngest one's 41. Isn't that some big old, bigger than me? They'll kiss me right in the mouth, man. They got big old beards. Big old boys. Good gracious. There's something else, man. God bless. What's your name? Osandalar. Osandalar. That's a good sounding name. Osandalar. What does it mean? God will restore? That's Joel 225. 
Joel 2, 25, it's a thunder. I, it's, it's a thunder from God. I will restore, says the Lord. Then he tells us what he'll restore. All that the devil has eaten up. All the canker worm. All the flying caterpillars has got. What's your name? Jason. Hey, Jason. What do you do? I work on a shipping and receiving job. Oh, shipping and receiving. What do they ship and receive? Uh, horticultural plants. Horticultural plants. Trees, shrubs, bushes. Perennial? That comes back. Oh, okay, good. I'll tell you one clue. My wife went to Lowe's Hardware and bought a bunch of brown plants at half price. Don't buy brown plants. <laughs> unless you've got a real resurrection ministry. <laughs> Honest to God, she went to, they, they sold her some plants at Lowe's Hardware, like Home Depot. And they were brown, but they were maybe a half a half price, you know. But uh, some of them lived, honestly, but most of them. What do you do? Flight instructor. Flight instructor. Oh, man. It, it, you're long. I don't see how you fit in there. <laughs> do people listen pretty well while you're doing it? Isn't that good? I don't know how to fly. I flew with a guy once, and he tried to tell me. I said, well, show me how to land. He said, land is easy. Walking away is hard. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. What do you think's a good plane now? Good plane? A personal plane? A personal plane? Cirrus? That's it. That's what my friend, he's got now. That wasn't what we was in. He said it flies so fast you barely can land it, honestly. He said it had the best electronics in it. That's what he's got, a Cirrus or whatever you call it. It got a parachute on his plane. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go there, but uh, it's nice to know you got it. Isn't that something? And uh, well, anyway, they deployed it six times. It's then uh, there's no fatalities. Isn't that something? Flight instructor. When he when I was doing it with him, you know, uh, he said, "See how fast you can turn to the to the left or right without losing altitude." That was hard. It's kind of like doing a donut, you know, and don't lose speed. So I said to him, "Is this thing got a brake on it like a tractor? You can stomp it and spin it around?" He said, "It does, but I'm not showing it to you." That's what he told me. That's true. Well, God bless you. What do you do? Um, nothing right now. I'm looking after my grandpa. Oh, looking after grandpa. God bless you. you got a big heart. It's got you in trouble before, honest to God, but you've got a big heart and a good heart. I'll tell you what, God's cutting you out of the herd in a good way. He's surrounding you with His, his grace and His presence. That's a good thing. So I'm glad. What's your name? Haley. Haley, God bless you. Got such a tender heart. Well, that's good. I like that. Well, got a ship guy and a flight guy and a good-hearted girl. What do you do there with the American Eagle shirt on? Inference. Inference. What? Yeah, good. Yeah. God bless you. I mean that. God wants you to be a soul winner, I'll tell you that. You'll never be satisfied till you do that. It's in you. He talked to you a long time about it, and you run. But uh, run to him, not away from him. Okay? It's good. He wouldn't call you to do it if you couldn't do it. People will come up and ask you, man, what happened? You'll tell them the story about Jesus. You believe that? I do. We've got to go. Adios. iPad, the guy that invented that's been coming to the meetings. Honest to God. I bought the iPad 1. Next week, iPad 2 came out. It's true. Yeah. yeah. It's true. You know how to use that? Hey, there's some stuff on there, boy. Man. What's your name? Alicia. What do you like to do? Anything fun? I like, I like to have fun, you know. I have some boundaries and stuff like that, but uh, I, I like exciting things. Me and my brother used to sit in the backyard and shoot cigarettes out of one another's mouth with a twenty two rifle. That's, that's infantry. We would sit in the backyard and shoot cigarettes out of one another's mouth with twenty two rifles. That's not. My mama would come to the door, swing the door open and holler, Hey, you boys quit wasting them shells. They cost money. Didn't say a thing about shooting Bobby in the mouth or Glenn in the nose. 
shooting cigarettes. Well, we've got to pray for people. Here's what God will do for you. He'll give you back your joy. How many of you want that? I mean, inward tranquility. Here's what it says. Tranquility of soul. Now, that's, that's getting real deep in you. See, most people, they have joy by their circumstances. If their circumstances go bad, they're mad. But God wants to give you Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Tranquility of soul. So no matter, no matter what circumstance, you're still happy. Acts 16. Remember that midnight Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises? In a prison. So circumstances can't keep us. But if you've got God active in your life, you'll have tranquility of soul. Yeah, I want that, don't you? You believe that? Me too. Well, uh, so I want to pray for you. Say, Lord, give me my joy. I take it back. It's mine. Devil, turn loose of joy. So you get your joy back. Now, another thing he wants to restore to you is confidence. See, you thought you heard God. You moved out. Didn't happen. Now you're going, oh, was that really God? Let me tell you about the devil. Uh, can I tell you the truth? You can be as fiery as anybody in the Bible, and then circumstances can change, and if you're not careful, you'll doubt everything God said to you. I'll show it to you in the Bible. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist. Preaching, behold, look, the Lamb of God. But now he's in prison. Doors are shut. All the friends are gone. He calls his servants to him and says, Please go and ask Jesus, Are you the one to come or should we look somewhere else? Woo. Now I want to tell you something about doubt. Doubt is deadly. Doubt is the wound that gives Birth to unbelief. Worst thing that can happen to you is be fearful and unbelieving. The Bible said that's the first people going to hell, the fearful and the unbelieving. So God wants to give you back your confidence. You want it? This is a night to restore. He's giving you back your joy. He'll give you back your confidence. Now, I'll tell you what happens. The devil has a substitute for everything. God has the genuine. So what is the devil's substitute for confidence? Arrogance. Arrogance. Strut around. See, that's the flesh. You understand what I'm talking about? There's a world difference between arrogance and confidence. There's a world of difference between familiarity and intimacy. Church today is too familiar with God when we need to be intimate with Him. You believe that? It's really true. It's true. That's true. There's a gentleman back there. You got your hands... Folded like that. The Lord said He's going to visit your house. I believe your whole family is about to be visited by the Lord. I'm telling you. He said, I'm going to visit your house. It's really true. It's true. You're hungry and it's going to fall on your descendants. It's Isaiah 44, 3. I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty, floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring, your descendants, and they will spring up like willows by a river bank. That's Isaiah 44. Well, we got to go. Adios. So you get back your joy. You get back your confidence. You get back your dreams. Think big. Believe God for big things. You know, you remember when you used to just see yourself out doing these things? Then you got busy doing this, doing that. Dream big again. Listen. Billy Graham. I heard him say it himself. He said, I used to stand out and preach to the swamp. That's before tape recorders. And he'd listen to his voice echo through the swamp. Whoa, 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 whoa. Great, a great prophetic friend I know. When he's a little bitty boy, he'd walk the railroad tracks picking up spikes. He'd get in his grandmother's backyard and he would spike those spikes down. Row after row after row after row after row. And he'd stand there as a little bitty boy preach to those railroad spikes. He said, I know you're spikes now, but one day you'll be people. He's preached to people, kings, all over the earth. But he started picking spikes, putting them in his grandmother's backyard. See, I'm going to tell you, don't let the devil steal your dream. He steals your dream, he'll steal your vision. Steals your vision, he'll pretty soon steal your life. 
you'll weary yourself with day by day by day nothingness. You have to have a driving goal. Do you believe that? Paul had it. He said, I've not yet grabbed that for which I've been grabbed. But I'm pushing on. My advice to you is don't ever get satisfied. Push on after the things of God. Well, you know. No. Well, you're, you're, you're hungry. You wouldn't be in a camp meeting like this. But God will, God's feeding that hunger. You get Psalms 63.1. I thirst for thee like in a dry and weary land. You get desperate like that, God will pour himself out on you. Psalms 63.1. You believe that, don't you? I like your little girl, the little girl that was here. She's watching and listening. You believe that? That's true. He says, yes, yes, he will, guy in the black shirt. He says to tell you, yes, yes, he will. So I don't know what you're asking him, but he says to you, yes, yes, he will. So whatever that is, say yes. Yes. You get it. That's right. Yes, yes, he will. True. Now I hear a wagon rolling. I bet somewhere in your lineage line, somebody brought in things in a, a rumbling wagon. Check out your heritage, okay? And I think even what rolled in that wagon has something to do with what God's talking to you about right now. I heard a, you've heard it like in an old movie, a wagon's coming. Well, anyway, I heard him coming. But he says, yes, yes, he will. Well, let's get out of it. Did I tell y'all Indians are coming? I mean, I started beating on that drum the other night. And he said Indians are coming. And they're going to teach us some things about protocol. I'm telling you. Anyway. I'm telling you. There's some stuff spinning around here. I believe that. Listen to me. I believe there's, I believe there's some treasure under the ground on this place. I know there's some treasure on the ground, but I'm saying to you, I believe there's some treasure under the ground. Remember when I went over there to Edmonton? I started preaching up from, I stopped and started singing a Jed Clampett song. Up from the ground came a bubbling crude. Now there's always been sand in, all in the sand pits, but after that, they said, they, they estimate 73 billion barrels of oil. Check it out. After that, listen. Always had been there, but something about a prophetic utterance. I'm standing in Fort Worth, Texas a few years ago, and I didn't feel good. I said, Lord, I don't like the way I feel. He said, I don't either. I said, what is it? He said, blight. Businesses was being nearly. I said, what are you going to do about it, God? Now watch this. He said, I'm standing in downtown Fort Worth. And I said, what do you want me to do? He said, point your finger right where you're at and scream. God's going to release treasures from the deep. So I'm standing in Travis Ab- what used to be Travis Avenue Baptist Church, and I screamed, Hey, God's going to release the treasures of the deep. Guess what happened? The largest oil, the largest gas reserve in the history of North America opened up, called the Barnett Shell. They started paying the people $1 million a month, $12 million a year to drill for gas. Some people having their houses bulldozed down, having gas wells dug. Here's, here's the corker. It was a very unique kind of a thing. Anybody that was heir in the owner of the land got the money even if they lived hundreds of miles away. The Barnett Shell. Google it. You don't have to be smart. Now Google something. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Barnett Shell. Largest gas reserve that we've discovered. Isn't that crazy? I'll tell you what it is. It's 2 Chronicles uh, 20. 20. Second Chronicles 20, 20 says, Trust the Lord, you'll be established, believe His prophets, and you will prosper. So I looked up the word prosper. Live at God's highest level for your life. Well, get what you need from God. He's available. Get what you need from God. He's not only available, but He's adequate. Here's your verse for it. Psalms 121, verse 1. I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made the heavens and the earth. I mean, if He did that, He's adequate. How did he make them? Smoke. There they were. It's true. Well, got to go. Adios, amigos. Au revoir. I told y'all that. How was it? Do you speak French? She does? You do speak? You speak French? I don't, but uh, speak some French. Tell us something good in French. Oh, my goodness. Dieu <laughs> fidèle. I don't know. See, I like that. Do it again. Dieu est fidèle. What? 
God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, yes, he is. How do you say God is good? Dieu est bon. Dieu est bon. Dieu est bon. Dieu est bon. Say something else in French. Dieu veut que les cœurs des um, de ceux qui sont perdus soient retournés à lui. Le Seigneur appelle le Canada à se tenir droit pour la justice de son peuple. Do you believe everything he needs? You have everything that you need he has? Yeah. Amen. That's what she's telling you. Everything you long after is a person. That's what God's trying to stir a passion. You believe that? Amen. He's really real. He's not a character captured in a leatherback book. No. He wants to walk among you and be your friend. Amen. Is that true? Amen. Amen. God bless you. I like that. Yeah. You study, you know, French? Me neither. Me neither. Remember now, running shoes on, spiritual running shoes. It's true. Man, I like the girl here. God's going to really use you in soul winning. He's already using you. It's true. Was that your little boy? Oh, wasn't he something? Did you see he wanted down here? He wanted to see what's up. Yeah, he, he bust a move on you. Well, let's go. What do you do? You're tall. Yes. A locksmith. Oh, man. Good. Can you pick a lock? Oh, man. That's something. I locked myself out of a car once. Called a locksmith. He couldn't get me in there. Called the police. They couldn't get me in there. I said, let me get your gun. They said, you can't shoot a gun in town. I said, I can if you'll give it to me. I was going to shoot the window out. Honestly, God. But uh, anyway. I'll tell you one thing. Don't knock the little window out of a Cadillac. I could have broke the windshield out and cheaper. I broke the little opera one down. Good Lord. Smaller ain't better, you know. It's true. What do you do? I'm a student. What are you studying? God. That's a good thing. I'll guarantee you, you'll never exhaust that. The more you get, the more you want. He's the only thing I know of you can't founder on. The more you get, the more you need. It's true. He's inexhaustible. The angels that sit before him, they, they go, holy! And then they see him, holy! Because he reveals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. He reveals more and more of himself. We won't get up there and go, yeah, yeah, this is just what I thought it'd be like. Heaven's continual revelation of God. We won't be up there and be bored going, good Lord, eternity here. I'll tell you about God, he's not as quiet as we thought he was. He likes a good frenzy. Let's get out of here. You ready? Planes will here. Are you going to? I pray for people if they want to be prayed for. Remember I told you to give you that anointing? Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Here's, here's another thing he'll give you. Romans 1, 11. I long to see that I might impart to you a spiritual enabling. That's what it says. Romans 1, 12 said it'll be good for both of us. It's in the Bible, honest to God. Yeah, you know it. It's true. That's right. Yep. Well, I want to pray for you for that anointing, okay? You believe we need anointing? Not one single miracle Jesus did till he received it. That's in the New Testament. You want anointing? There's one available for us. It's Psalms 92.10. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. That fresh oil will release my, will, will release my strength like that of a wild ox. I don't like that verse in King James. It says, my horn is exalted, exalted like the horn of a unicorn. That don't do nothing for me, but I like the wild ox one, don't you? You believe that? I like the kid on the end with goatee. What's your name? Courtney. Courtney? Courtney? Good. What's God doing in your life? Yep. 
That's exactly right. Prayed for you. Yeah, I'll tell you what God's doing you a favor. He's holding your feet to the fire. He's cutting friends away from you that you don't need and adding friends to you that you do need. Isn't that something? Uh, yeah. It's true. I'll tell you what you are. A warrior and the devil knows it. So he's been trying to neutralize you. A warrior. Okay? That's true. How old are you? How? 25. Good. Yeah. God bless you. She's not giving you any slack either, is she? That's a good thing. That's, it really is good. Isn't that something? Yeah. I'll tell you something. You won't believe me right now, but one day you will. You're going to write books. It's true. There's words in you. And you don't think you can express yourself. But God said, I'll give you the pen of a ready writer. I'll throw a verse around your neck. A back at 2, 2. A back at 2, 2. You'll wear it like a chain. It says, it says write the vision, make it plain. So people that get it can run with it. Write the vision, make it plain. Okay? Tell him it's the truth. It's true. Gotta go. Here's another one of these things. <laughs> Better not mess with it. What do you do? Well, I'm in ministry. What do you do? Well, I do healing rooms and outreach. And Judas had a ministry too. Remember him? He said he had part and lot in the ministry. Isn't that awful? It, that's what it says. But he didn't make the cut, did he? So you got healing rooms? Yes. That's a good thing. That's true. We're all supposed to be in the healing and knowing. It's true. The prophetic. We're all supposed to be prophetic. Moses said, I wish all of God's people were prophets. That's what he said. Joel said, we all can. What do you do? I'm in the ministry. That's a good thing. What kind of ministry? Uh, healings. That's a good ministry. God, what's your name? Jagan. Digging? From India. God bless you. I went to India once. Good, Lord. Flew forever to get over there. Honest to God, flew forever. I don't know how many hours. So I get there just in time. Coach McCartney, the promise keeper guy, he said, I want you to preach. I said, I'm going to bed. <laughs> now this is the honest to God truth. I go to bed. I'm in a room. I'm over against the wall on the bed asleep. Sound asleep. <laughs> And I'm awakened, and there's somebody in my room crying. <laughs> okay, okay. Over here on the opposite side of the room, I'm awakened by a man crying. Just, and I mean, boohooing. I don't know to this day how he got in my room, but he's in my room crying. And he's, he's, squall, he's squalling. And here's what he's crying. I, I, and he's, he's Asian. I'm so sorry. God sent me here. He said, you have word. I'm so sorry. God sent me here. He said you'd have a word. Now, I'm mad. So I roll over. There he is. He's sitting over there on a little divan crying. I'm so sorry. He said, God said you'd have word. Now, the only word I had that God had given me was, he said, somebody will ask you for a word, tell them it's 50 billion U.S. dollars. So, I'm mad, I'm laying in bed, and I said, well, only word I've got is 50 billion U.S. dollars. He goes crazy. Now, I'm laying in bed in my underwear and a sheet. And here's this crazy guy over there. He's got a briefcase. When I said $50 billion, he is, he's beside himself. He fell in the floor. He jumped up. He's digging in the briefcase. He's talking. I don't know what he's... I thought, I'd better get out of this bed, you know. Here's what he does. So help me God. He digs down in that briefcase and he holds up an 8 by 5 card or 3 by 5 and it said $50 billion U.S. dollars. The Lord had told him, go over there to India... Preacher will be there, go in the room, ask him for a word, and he'll confirm the fact, $50 billion. The Lord had told him, if you'll honor me, love me, serve me, I'll give your business $50 million profit. Then I'm going, I want your, I want your cell number. Your, uh, uh, isn't that crazy? That's the truth, though. That was, that was India. I went to Villa Fan, something like that. 
Basil Philippe, it's all the way on the other side. Good Lord. Basil Philip Pack or something like that. You could say it if you knew what it was. But anyway, that's what happened. So I, I get there and I'm, I'm trying to get on the platform and here comes a bunch of cars with flags on this bumper. And some guys jumped out with fully automatic machine pistols. A shake! And out comes this guy dressed like a military person. And they said, you're following him? I go, I'm following him. <laughs> Honest to God, we went on the platform and I'm supposed to preach and they set him in front of me and those two guys stood there with automatic, fully automatic machine pistols. So he's sitting there very erect and I said, Lord. The Lord said, I got a word for him. I said, God, I'm not messing with him. <laughs> Lord said, I got a word for him. I said again, God, I'm not messing with him. There's, I don't know. I don't know how many people there was. Out in a field, thousands and thousands of people. But anyway, so we preached and we have a banquet afterwards. So we go to the banquet and in comes that guy with the two guards. and the, So he's sitting right, right beside me. And so I'm trying to eat. And the Lord said, I got a word for him. I said, God. <laughs> So I said, Lord, okay, Lord, what is it? He said, he's got a neck problem, and I want to heal it. And I said again, I don't want to mess with him. When I said, I don't want to mess with him, my neck locked up. I mean, I, it was hurting like you couldn't believe. So I said, this is true. I said, sir, do you have a neck problem? He said, yes, I do. He said, I'd had a car wreck. They'd done some surgery. I didn't think I was going to be able to make this meeting because of the neck problem. I said to him, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to pray for you in the meeting, but God's going to heal your neck. And I'll tell you what, God healed his neck. And he was the minister of ministries over India. He said, you can do anything you want to do in India. God healed his neck just like that. Because mine got free too. That was, that was India. Yeah, that's true. Phyllis Shillipack. I don't know where I was at. Bazapan or something like that. Anyway. Ah, that's right. I went to Snake Charmer. You, they're over there. I got it on television footage. Honest to God. I'm filming this Snake Charmer. Cobra comes up out of a bucket. So I zeroed my camera in on the Cobra's eyes. And the Lord said, now... Rotate over on the handler's eyes. And they're, they're absolutely the same. Wow. So that's when I realized this ain't a parlor trick. Right. There's a demon behind this. Guy, the snake handler had the same eyes as the cobra. Ooh. Huh? Well, okay. I had fun. Don't let me oversleep in the morning. They'll be calling from Calvary going, where is he? And I go, well, he's somewhere in transit. It's true. God bless your heart. Well, he'll give you what you need if you'll ask him. Remember I told you, this is a time of an assured welcome. This is a time he'll hear you and help you. Remember 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now, what's the name of this conference? Transformation glory. I'll tell you one way to accelerate that. You want it? Put this in your heart. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. It says, as we behold him with unveiled faces, all of us are changed from glory unto glory. Isn't that something? Transform. Just like that. Adios. So nice. You like singing prophetically, don't you? Continue. Just keep on doing it. You believe that? Like the boy in the, right there got the beard. What's your name? Stephen. Stephen what do you do, Stephen? Oh, yeah, I saw a light spinning around you. I'll give you a verse. Psalms 144, verse 1. That verse says, He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. It's just, oh, see there? He's trying to get something to you, man. Isn't that crazy? Trying to get something to you. Trying to teach your hands. See there? At least it's consistent. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the same way. Well, we gotta go. Here we go. Who, who's dismissing us? Oh, the.
the product. Yeah. Get back there and get it. <laughs> that way they won't have to ship it to Karsbakistan or wherever. Okay, here's one. Let your works appear. This is out of Psalms 90, verse 16 and 17. And it talks about seeing the mighty hand of God at work. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is a DVD, I suspect. And so, uh, yeah, you'll have to watch me. One lady's got a little grandson, and all he wants to do is watch my DVDs. She sent me a picture of him watching that. And she said, don't you want to watch cartoons? He says, no, I want to watch Bobby Connor. She's, she called the office. She said, please send us another DVD. I'm sick of this one. Yeah, so that's, that's what she said. <laughs> this, is a, this is a CD. This is by me and Paul Keith and, and Bob Jones. And that's that Coeur d'Alene meeting we was talking about where the gemstones uh, started falling. So uh, Ring of Fire is what, what, what it's called. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, I love, I love this little book. This actually happened to me. I was sitting at a desk. It's called The Cross. I wrote this book before Mel Gibson did the movie. And I was going to study and preach about The Cross and I preached about the cross many, many times. I'm pulling the chair closer to the desk. And I said, Lord, please make this more than mere words. When I said that, I was jerked up out of the office, carried back 2,000 years in history, and I'm standing on the streets of Jerusalem in clothes just like this. I see a mob coming down the street. It's Jesus bearing his cross. I, did, I, I said, this can't happen. He got about from here to those, those flags. When my eyes met his, I fell to the cobblestones, and I get up and go to the cross with Christ. I'm telling you, it actually happened to take you about five minutes to read it, a whole lifetime to get over it. So anyway, here, here's one. Dread champions. Remember I told you, God said, study the names, the Hebrew names of the mighty men that assembled themselves around David. You'll find the character and the conduct God wants us to have in these end times. Now here's, here's one. This, this, one I, this one they said was in the top ten bestsellers in the world for a while. And I wrote it in, not, uh, in 2003. It's God's supernatural power. It talks about how to walk in the anointing, how to steer the anointing, how to transfer the anointing. And we tell a lot about happen, what happened to me when I was a little, a little kid, a little child. A voice spoke to me and said, don't get on that pony. I'm out in the yard. Remember that? A voice from heaven said, don't get on that pony. So I ran in. My brother was crippled. I ran in, jumped in the bed. My brother came hobbling up and said, what is it? I said, don't get on the pony. He said, what pony? I said, I don't know. Then every time I'd get steel, a voice would say, don't get on the pony. Then one day my mother put our clothes in a little box. My uncle drove down and got us. Me and my mother and my brother got in a car and we started driving for hours. Pulled down the road. Went to a little parking lot. And a woman walks up with a pony and says, get on the pony. They had brought us to an orphan's home. That's how they take the kids away from the parents. They put them on a little pony and ride them away. I slid on the other side of the seat and started screaming. Me and my brother, we're not getting on the pony. My mother started crying and said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And commanded my uncle to turn the car around and carry us back home. All of that's in this book about, see, God can speak to a little sandy-headed boy out in the yard if we'll listen. It saved our family from being broke up. Isn't that something? So how to walk in supernatural power. And anyway, so y'all will read that, won't you? That's good. Uh, we could sign books. We signed it, but it'll be late. I don't mind signing a few. Who's going to? Well, somebody will have to drive me back later. Miguel, I'm so sorry. It'll be all right. We'll get, we'll get some Tim Hortons in the morning. That's right. We'll get that Tim Hortons and a couple of sugar donuts or something. Got the Lord, I may fly the plane. Where's that attendant at? Yeah. Eh, probably not. Okay. okay, well, that's true. You want him to talk to you, don't you? He, God will talk to you. He's going to speak to you. You get, you get a verse from the Bible. You get John 10, 3. It says, my sheep will hear my voice. So he's going to talk to you, okay? And then you'll be accountable. But he's going to, how old are you? 23. He's going to talk to you. I really mean it. In your heart. But it'll be louder than in your ears. You believe that? It's true. He'll show you what's right and wrong. It's what you've been asking. And he'll show you. I see light spinning around your head. Good light, not bad. Good. What do you think about that? You believe God will talk to her? He may not talk to you yet, but he'll talk to her. It's true. He's going to talk to her. I'll tell you, that's true. 
You want to succeed. I'll give you a verse that will guarantee you success if you'll do it. You want it? Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8 said, The words of this book shall not depart from your eyes. You'll meditate upon it day and night, and it'll guarantee you overwhelming success. That's good, isn't it? Overwhelming success. True. It's true. What do you want to do? You know yet? I was going to, uh, that's true. You can do that. You can get into it. One time a little boy came up to me, red-headed freckles on his face. I ran my hand in his head like that and I said, Hey boy, I'll tell you what you're going to do when you get old. You're going to be a brain surgeon. I'll tell you what, that was maybe 37 years ago. He's a very, very uh, wealthy brain surgeon right now. He called me in the middle of medical school. He said, If you've misled me, I'm going to kill you. That's what he said. That's what he said. Match his name. But you can get into medicine. But if you'll get into the Word of God, maybe you'll have something better than medicine. I wrote in the Shepherd's Rod 2012, this is a year God begins to merge medicine and prayer together. Doctors will start using prayer with medicine. So that'll work. Good. That's true. That's right. Here's what he said. He said, if you'll do that, Joshua 1.8, money won't be a problem. It's true. Esco, adios. You'll have to take your It's hard to close down a meeting that's like that, isn't it? But obviously, Bobby doesn't want to be here at breakfast time. But all of you ladies in the house might want to be here in the morning. Woo! Come on. Pastor Victoria. Er